Let's talk to God together. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you. Your forgiveness changes lives. That the forgiveness that Jesus offered 2,000 years ago changed my life in 1991, and you've changed many, many thousands of lives since. Lord, thank you. Thank you for second chances. Thank you for hope. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for your love. And Lord, it's our prayer tonight that you would be glorified in everything that is said and done. Lord, we all pray that we would encounter the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit changing us, shaping us into the men and women of God that you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. Well, I am so glad that you are here and you are not confused. I am not a guest speaker. It's me, Pastor Joe. So you are witnessing history. This is the first time I've ever preached wearing glasses. So if I fall off the stage, blame it on the glasses. If I preach really well, blame it on the glasses, okay? So I'm so glad that you are here. If you are joining us online, thank you so much. We know that right now we've been having some technical glitches with our uh, feed right now. So thank you for your patience. We're working it out. We wanna make things better and better each week. Uh, We believe wholeheartedly and we're dedicated to our online service. So thank you for your patience. So interact with one another, uh, fill out a a connect card, uh, share prayer requests, Quest, reach out to us with an email. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to know what God is doing in your life, whether you're in Minnesota or Alaska or Montana or wherever you are, we'd love to hear what God is doing in your life. Now, Parker Campus, what an incredible celebration that you guys had last weekend at the close of the service as, as that individual was baptized. We got to see him on the video here. So cool. And we praise God for changing lives there in Parker. So thanks for joining us. I'm excited to be there with you today at our, in our alumni hall. And I know that God is going to show up and move today. And today, if you are a first time guest, we're so glad that you have decided to check out our church for the first time. Now, Now, I want you to know something. If you're looking for a perfect church, you'll have to search in another place because we are not a perfect church. I'm not a perfect pastor and the people you're sitting around are not perfect either. So, well, you're supposed to laugh. Y'all acted like you're offended. Well, how dare he? I am perfect. All right. Uh, We celebrate grace, we celebrate forgiveness, we celebrate second chances, we believe that God wholeheartedly loves us unconditionally and we just wanna demonstrate that love to God's people as well. If you have your Bible or a Bible app, you can turn to Acts chapter five, beginning at verse 12, and you'll notice we have a very large passage of scripture, Acts 5, 12 through 42. Some of it I'm gonna skip over, some of it I'm gonna give you a summary of. If you don't, if you did not bring a Bible, you can reach underneath the seat in front of you and there should be a Bible there that you can use. In fact, if you don't have a Bible, we want to encourage you to take that home. Parker Campus, you can hop up right now in Alumni Hall, go back to the back of the room right in the center. At a table, there's a stack of Bibles. You only need one, but you can take as many as you need. You can hop up right now and go get a Bible. Uh, One of the reasons why we encourage you to uh, take a Bible home if you don't have one that you can read and understand is we fully believe that if we read the Word of God and and we apply the word of God, God will change our lives. That, it's that simple. And, and so if you're a follower of Jesus and you've really not been experiencing much change in your life, I would encourage you to get in God's word on a regular basis because God's gonna change you. Just like you don't know how an apple that you eat gives you nourishment, As you read God's word, you have no idea how God is nourishing you and strengthening you and changing you. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been discouraged from doing something that you really wanted to do? And somebody said, no, it's not a good idea. No, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you're cut out for it. Uh, Maybe it was playing on a rec league uh, and they told you that you couldn't play softball. Maybe it was exercising or getting back into health. Was there something that you really wanted to do in life and someone discouraged you from doing it? Maybe it was a parent, a trusted friend, a loved one, whatever. 
When I was in, um, after I graduated from high school in 1991, I began to work on a bricklaying crew. Now we laid brick and block all over Middle Tennessee. After three years, I realized that God was calling me to begin college. So I scheduled an appointment with my former guidance counselor that had known me all throughout my high school years. And when she knew me, she knew I wasn't very quality person. Uh, I, I didn't have a whole lot of positive things that people could talk about. So I scheduled an appointment to talk to her and ask her, what do I need to do to enroll in our local university? Uh, she knew that I had been suspended from school for fighting. She knew I'd been suspended from school from, for getting drunk. Uh, she knew me basically as a punk. So I started off the conversation right. I sat down and I explained to her that I had given my life to Jesus three years before. I had trusted him as savior of my life and I had been radically changed from the inside out. I explained to her that I'd been attending church, that I'd been volunteering in youth ministry, and I knew that God was leading me to get a higher quality education. I asked her what steps I needed to take to enroll at Austin P. State University. Instead of encouraging me, she looked at me and frankly said, Joe, some people weren't meant to go to college. Five years later, I walked across the stage, received my diploma at Austin P. State University. And I even made the Dean's List a few times along the way. Now that's, those were easy classes. I took like PE and something else. So it's participation time with Pastor Joe. If you're watching us online, raise your hand. Parker Campus, you guys raise your hand. Raise your hand if after you experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus, other people did not believe that you had really changed. Okay, now raise your hand if it took a long time for people to believe that you had really changed. Okay, now raise your hand if some people in your life today still doubt the change that you experienced when you gave your life to Jesus. Isn't it amazing, right? So finish this phrase for me. When the going get tough, the tough Today, we're gonna to be looking at a uh, part of our series in Acts as we cover the life of the apostles. And we're gonna be looking at when the disciples really experience some intense opposition in their lives. In fact, the first time they've experienced physical harm because they were a follower of Jesus. Now, here's the reality. If you and I focus on trying to convince other people that we've really changed, we're never going to be able to do it. But if we focus on following Jesus and we focus on just letting our light shine, your whole world, your whole people will be able to see, but your focus can't be on letting people see the change in you. You've really got to focus on Jesus because even when you're just a little bit off on your motive, you're going to end up, uh, it's going to end up a disaster. So over the past month, as we've looked at the example of Acts in the lives of the apostles, we've seen that the Jewish leaders have attempted to discourage and threaten the apostles teaching about Jesus. Yet Peter and John and the rest of the apostles continued teaching about Jesus and crowds of people were listening to them. Thousands of people were being born again Thousands of people were trusting in Jesus to be their savior and Lord. Thousands of people were experiencing new life and forgiveness of sins. They believed and they received Jesus as their savior and they committed to follow him. Which if you've not yet chosen to become a follower of Christ by believing and receiving Christ as your savior to receive forgiveness of sins. I do want you to know that at the close of our service, members of our prayer team will be here at the front. They would love to talk with you. They would love to pray with you and they would love to lead you to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. So let's read what happened when the disciples decided to push through the threats 
and keep teaching about Jesus. Acts chapter five, beginning at verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all healed. This was an incredible moment and season in the life of the church. And I'm gonna jump in with my first point and it's this, when God is working, expect opposition. So it's clear, every one of us sees that God is working. Thousands of people, multitudes of people were becoming born again through the teaching of the apostles. Miracles were happening. Men and women were getting up and walking. People were being healed of diseases. Sick people were even being drug out into the streets, hoping that Peter's shadow might fall on them and perhaps they would be healed. It's an amazing moment in the life of the early church. The apostles had been threatened, but they persevered through the opposition. And now they were experiencing something incredible. Even in the days of Jesus, it didn't happen like this. Now you had apostles teaching the good news about Jesus and multitudes and thousands of people were experiencing this life change. Life change was happening all around. God was working. The Holy Spirit was moving. Lives were being changed. People were being healed. It was, it was like a, a bomb of explosion and joy was erupting in Jerusalem. But this was not the finish line. This was not the end game. This wasn't the end goal. While all this excitement was taking place, there was a group of people that were not happy and we know who they were, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Let's read on in verse 17. But the high priest, so all this great stuff is happening, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. So now we see that the opposition is about to really begin. They were jealous because now the Jewish people were looking at the apostles as their Jewish uh, or as their leaders of faith. They were outraged because the apostles ignored their threats. So they arrested the apostles, not just Peter and John now, now they arrested all of them and they tossed them into a public prison. And the reason why they threw them into a public prison is because the Jewish leaders wanted to ruin the reputation of Peter and John. They wanted the, the community to believe that Peter and John and James and the rest of the apostles were criminals so that they would stop following the apostles teaching. Understand, as God is working in your life, expect opposition to come your way. See, as you're growing into the man or woman of God that God has called you to be, as you're overcoming some, some sins that you might be continue to wrestle with, expect opposition to happen. Maybe it's your friends or family that, that knew you before you became a follower of Christ and now they mimic you or they mock you or they make fun of you. Maybe they, you have a spouse and your spouse continually tells you every weekend when you decide to go to worship, I don't know why you believe in that nonsense. I want you to understand, God is going to use you to change your world. God is going to use you to change your world. So opposition is going to come because God sees that you are loving others and that you are trying to lead others to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So opposition is going to come your way. Expect it, but don't run from it. 
Expect the opposition, but don't be frightened by it. Expect the opposition, but don't stop following God. Don't deny your faith. Don't resist it. Roll with it. Roll with the opposition and remember, during opposition, continue living out truth. So while you're getting buffeted, while you're getting challenged, continue to live out truth. Now the apostles were put in that public prison. They were thrown there, they were locked up. The Pharisees and Sadducees left. And in verse 19, we see what happens. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now, in the context of what was happening, should we expect anything less than an angel showing up, unlocking the doors and giving them a word? I mean, we're seeing miracle after miracle happening at this time. We're seeing multitudes of people give their lives to Jesus. So it, do, it should not surprise us that an angel of the Lord shows up, opened the prison doors for the apostles, and the angel did not command them to run away. The angel did not say the Pharisees and Sadducees are going to continue to come after you. So you guys go build a big fort and hide out in there and I'll let you know when it's safe to come out. What did the angel of the Lord tell them to do? Go right back to where you were, go, go right back to that temple and continue to teach the same message that got you arrested in the first place. During opposition, continue living out truth. That's what the apostles did. That's what they knew to do. They knew they weren't called to go run and hide. That's what Pastor Joe might do. I, I might say, well, okay, God, I'm going to go to a nicer community. I'm going to go to a nicer town. When you're faced with opposition for sharing the beautiful truth of grace and forgiveness, continue to live out the truth. Now understand this about opposition. Opposition comes from the outside, but also opposition comes from the inside, doesn't it? I mean, for me, honestly, the greatest opposition that I face in my life since I became a follower of Jesus has not been from the outside. It's been from my own insecurities and anxieties and depressions and worries and fears and from the old man inside my life. The greatest opposition that I face is often myself. Now, maybe that's you, maybe it's not. Maybe I'm just up here confessing and you guys think I'm crazy. But when mocking and ridicule comes your way, that's coming from the outside. So stand firm and keep gently teaching the good news about Jesus. Use your words, use your actions, Keep loving others even when it's hard, even when you're discouraged, even when you're overwhelmed, continue to love others and continue to let the good news of Jesus flow out of your life through your actions, through your words and through your love. But when you're dealing with that enemy on the inside, that old man, that old flesh that we all walk around in, if you wrestle with anxiety and fear and depression, Keep on living out truth on the inside. Keep on reminding yourself that you are God's child, that you are born of God. And according to 1 John 5, 18, the evil one cannot touch you. Remind yourself of that incredible truth. That's the way that we continue to live out truth and love. And there's something beautiful that happens when we live out truth. And it's also a little odd. Uh, when we live out the truth and we face opposition, you're going to discover that you're able to rejoice in painful circumstances that may come your way. Rejoice in painful circumstances that may come your way. 
So a little going back to our passage of scripture in Acts, the Jewish leaders showed up. Remember Peter and John, the rest of the apostles were gone. They're back in the temple. They're teaching the word of God. The Jewish leaders show up. They're looking in their prison. Where are the apostles? We locked them up in here. So they discovered the prison was empty and that the apostles had returned to the temple and they were still teaching that life-changing news of Jesus. Now they were furious. Now they were ticked off. They'd been threatened. They'd been threatened. They'd been locked up. They'd been locked up again. Now they're set free and they're right back in the temple. They arrested the apostles again. They went to the temple again. They got them again. And when there were questions, the apostles said, we must obey God rather than human authority. And so for the first time, for the first time in verse 40, the Jewish leaders had the apostles flogged. Okay, now flogging is a big deal. Especially if like me, if you grew up Catholic, you grew up with an understanding of what flogging was. Flogging is what they did to Jesus before they crucified him. Flogging is what almost killed Jesus. They took whips of, of leather and they tied bone and sharp rocks to the ends of that, the, the whip. And it, the whip had many ends and they beat the apostles with it. And as they did that, they were ripping out chunks of their back. When the, uh, when the apostles were finished being flogged, their backs were bare. Essentially, at least the top layer of skin had been ripped off of their backs. They were beaten severely. And the, the, uh, the Dr. Luke who writes this doesn't go into the gory details because he knew that his audience understood what flogging was. Oftentimes here in 2020, we don't understand it. Flogging was a severe, inhumane, harsh, cruel penalty. And in fact, when they were finished being beaten or flogged, their backs looked more like hamburger meat than a human back. So how did the apostles respond to that? They were only doing what the angel of the Lord told them to do, right? You can't make it up. The angel of the Lord showed up and said, go right back, do what you do, speak the truth in the temple. They went back, they got arrested again. And this time they were severely beaten. We'll look at verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Now I want you to circle these words in your Bible if you write in your Bible. Circle the word rejoicing and circle the words worthy to suffer. Rejoicing and worthy to suffer. That doesn't seem like those words go together very well, do they? It's like, it's not a Reese's cup. Two great tastes that go great together, chocolate and peanut butter rejoicing and worthy to suffer or suffering don't seem like they go well together at all. Can you imagine how painful it must have been for the apostles to rejoice in this moment? Their backs had been ripped open, all 12 of them. They're leaving. I, I, you know, they're, they're leaving after being severely punished they're bent over, I'm sure, I'm just imagining in my mind, they're, they can't really put their cloaks back on because if their cloaks are on, it's just gonna irritate the skin on their back. And so they're walking and they're leaving and they're bleeding and they're rejoicing. Rejoicing. <laughs> rejoicing while they were suffering. Now, we don't talk a lot about suffering in today's church, but the reality is Jesus made a promise that all followers of Jesus are going to experience suffering. All followers of Jesus are going to experience some type of persecution. Troubles and opposition, that may come your way as a follower of Jesus. When they do, I want to encourage you, yes, acknowledge it. Yes, seek help. Yes, seek prayer but also celebrate. Celebrate 
when you receive, when you suffer because of the name of Jesus, because God has counted you worthy to suffer. And that's a hard thing to do. Celebrate the fact that you're worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Rejoice when you experience ridicule or mocking or people spread false information about you that's not true. Smile if you suffer financially for the sake of the good news of Jesus. Rejoice and be glad because you are part of a 2,000 year long line of followers of Jesus who have suffered for the sake of Christ. And we celebrate not because of the pain that may come, but we celebrate primarily because nothing can stop the mission of changed lives. Nothing can stop the mission of changed lives. Understand this, the gospel is not my idea. The gospel is not the church's idea. Telling people about hope and forgiveness, telling people that they can have a second chance at life and a third chance at life and a fourth chance at life, that was birthed in God's heart and his love for you and for me. And he entrusted us as followers of Jesus to let the whole world know as much as we can and as much as we are able to know about the forgiveness of sins and the hope that Jesus offers. Nothing can stop the mission of changed lives. Look what happened in Acts 5.42. Every day, this is right after they were beaten, Every day in the temple from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, we're gonna stop right there. Did you catch that? The, the apostles went back, they continued to teach and preach in the name of Jesus, continued to teach about the forgiveness of sins. And in those days, the disciples were increasing in number. Other translations say multiply, um, rapidly multiplying. The apostles left rejoicing and they continued to tell others about forgiveness, hope and mercy. And the more that they told others, the more rapidly believers began to spring up. The more the gospel was told, the more that people lived out changed lives, the more and more people surrendered and received Jesus as savior. Even while there was great opposition from the Jewish leaders that was holding them back and threatening them and now even torturing them for the name of Jesus. You know, as we've learned through the COVID-19 season, nothing can stop God's mission of changing lives, can it? Not one thing. I mean, we've seen more people baptized in this season, this length of time, than I think in Calvary's history in this short little season. 148 individuals have trusted Christ as their savior since COVID began and have followed through with baptism. Do you know why that happened? The, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I, want, I want you to applaud, but not just yet. The doors were closed on Sunday mornings. The doors were closed on Saturday. The office had minimal contact with people. We did everything that we could to try to get that message of hope online. And the Holy Spirit of God blessed it. And the Holy Spirit of God on the other side of the camera began to work and draw people to him. In the midst of the opposition, believers rapidly multiplied because nothing can stop the mission of God on this planet. So how do you respond when your faith is challenged? How do you respond when you experience opposition? Do you shrug your shoulders and give up? Do you get angry and retreat? Or do you roll with it? Remember this, if difficulties come your way because of your faith in Jesus, because you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that you believe Jesus Christ 
died on the cross, paying the penalty for your sin, that he rose from the dead three days later, that he ascended into heaven, and you believe that one day he's going to return, and all you want to do right now is get to know God more and more, get to know Jesus more and more, and let others know about the love that he has for them. If that is what you want to do, opposition's gonna come, rejoice in it, celebrate in it, because God considers you worthy to suffer for the good news and that ain't bad. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We're, we're, we're so amazed at the faith of the apostles. We're so amazed at what they experienced as eyewitness followers of Jesus that they couldn't back down from what they had seen with their own eyes. God, thank you for their boldness and their courage and their faith. And now, Father, we pray that same courage and boldness and faith would rest on our hearts when we experience opposition, when we feel overwhelmed, and when we're fighting on the inside as well as holding off opposition on the outside. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us in such a way that we'd be so fruitful as followers of Jesus, that the love of God would flow from our hearts and lives and we would love our enemies and we'd pray for those who persecute us and we'd show grace to ourselves as well. God, thank you for life change. Thank you for the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you want to find out more about a life-changing relationship with Jesus, I want to encourage you after this last song, come down and talk to our prayer team. They would love to talk with you and pray with you. And in fact, if you have any other prayer needs in your life, I'd love for you to come down and let them know they'd be honored to pray for you. Let's stand together and worship.